whether or not economics has actually contributed positively to the world is contested. And it's, of course, necessary to admit that economics has been put to bad use, whether through overt malfeasance or inadvertent error. The question as to whether economics as such has been a net benefit for humanity will have to be, at least for our context here today, approached through the lens of the use and abuse of homo economicus itself as representative of economic models more generally. Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. In this episode, Dr. Jordan Baller, Director of Research at the Center for Religion, Culture, and Democracy, delivered a plenary lecture at Acton's first annual academic colloquium entitled, Is Homo Economist Sovereign in His Own Sphere? A Challenge from Neo-Calvinism from the Neoclassical Model. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Our keynote lecture is by Dr. Jordan Baller. Dr. Baller is Director of Research at the Center for Religion, Culture, and Democracy. He directs the Kuiper Conference and is Associate Director of the Junius Institute for Digital Reformation Research at Calvin Theological Seminary. With Melvin Flickema, he served as general editor of the Abraham Kuyper Collected Works in Public Theology. He is the author of Ecumenical Babel, Confusing Economic Ideology in the Church of Social Witness, Covenant Causality in Law, a study in the theology of Wolfgang Muskelis, and Get Your Hands Dirty, Essays on Christian Social Thought and Action, which is available at our book table. His paper is entitled, Is Homo Economicus Sovereign in His Own Sphere? A Challenge from Neo-Calvinism for the Neoclassical Model. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Baller. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Dylan. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here today, to be here in person. Um, I've done some things over Zoom over the last year and a half. Maybe some of you guys have done that too, but I don't, this might be the first scholarly colloquium that I've done um, since the new times. So I'm very grateful to Dylan, to Dan, uh, to Sarah, to all those who put in the work uh, to make this possible, the Journal of Markets and Morality for sponsoring it, uh, of course, the Acton Institute for hosting. I'm very eager to talk about much of the things that we've, we've heard and already discussed today. I have a couple of caveats or confessions to make right up front, and you can decide whether you want to absolve me of these uh, a- until after the talk. Uh, you know, I have a lot of humility approaching the, the question that I raise in the title of this piece from the perspective of a theologian. I'm not a trained economist, and I didn't even stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so um, I want to be very careful about the kinds of claims I'm making and um, the provisionality with which I'm holding them. So um, that said, it is the nature of interdisciplinary scholarship and inquiry and dialogue to require a kind of risk and to step out and speak about things that maybe you aren't as comfortable with and be open to correction. Um, So I am very much looking forward to the discussion parts uh, afterwards, both during our time together formally as well as perhaps afterwards. There's a lot of dispersed knowledge in this room that I want to take in. Um, I also listed to Dylan who did a podcast with Dan and Sarah about this colloquium. And he said these were supposed to be first drafts. So I thought he was, everybody else seems like really developed and this is a first draft. So I I took him at his word, but anyway, this paper is offered in that spirit. So please accept it that way. The last decade of the 19th century opened with a confluence of significant events for the relationship between ethics and economics. In 1890, Alfred Marshall's Principles of Economics was first published, and this was to be the standard text of economics for the next half century. Indeed, on some accounts in the history of economic thought, Marshall's work marks the boundary between the classical and the neoclassical schools of economic thought. In 
For his part, Marshall observed that on his presentation of the discipline, as he puts it in the preface to his first edition, quote, the laws of economics are statements of tendencies expressed in the indicative mood and not ethical precepts in the imperative. Now, the long story of the relationship between religion and economic thought, or more precisely between theology and economics, or even Marshall's own episode within this larger story is certainly beyond the scope of this paper and our time together today. Suffice it to say that Marshall was certainly not the first to propose a distinction, a sharp distinction, between the normative and the positive and between ethics and economics. In her book, The Rise of Political Economy as a Science, for instance, Deborah Redman asserts that Francis Bacon in the 16th century was, quote, the first to insist that science and theology be held apart. Even as she admits in the next sentence, this does not, however, mean that Bacon's philosophy was not influenced by religion. Alas, the influence of religion against the designs and desires of so many of its culture despisers had not yet waned even by Marshall's time. Wealth and the human person were the two great topics of economics for Marshall. And as he puts it, quote, man's character has been molded by his everyday work and the material resources which he thereby procures more than by any other influence, unless it be that of his religious ideals. And the two great forming agencies of the world's history have been the religious and the economic. Now, while Marshall would focus his energies on the economic forming agency of world history, two other contemporary figures would usher in important eras in the religious engagement of political economy and social thought. These figures have already been introduced and discussed here today. The year after Marshall's landmark work appeared, two other texts were put forth. First, the papal encyclical Rerum Novarum of Pope Leo XIII on May 15, 1891. And later that year, the social question and the Christian religion given by Abraham Kuyper as a speech on November 9, 1891 to open the Christian Social Congress in Amsterdam. This was later published in amplified form that same year. In their respective and complementary ways, these two works would open up new lines of inquiry and discovery into the relationship between religion and economics. Rerum Novarum is typically viewed as the fountainhead of modern Catholic social teaching, a body of work continuing through to the present day in various texts, proclamations, exhortations, and encyclicals up through today, and most recently in the promulgation of the encyclical Fratelli Tutti by Pope Francis, whose anniversary was just uh, earlier this week, and I, I, maybe I missed the email from the Acton Institute celebrating that, that one-year anniversary, I don't know. Anyway, we could talk about Fratelli Tutti at, perhaps at a, a future conference. Um, Abraham Kuyper's life and work, in some ways essentially captured in his 1891 speech, can likewise be seen as inaugurating a qualitatively different and yet no less substantive tradition of theological, philosophical, and social inquiry, often called neo-Calvinism. This present paper is a foray into the relationship between neo-Calvinism and neoclassical economics, focused particularly on the question of the neoclassical model of economic man, the so-called homo economicus, and its legitimacy and limitations from the perspective of Christian theology with a neo-Calvinist accent. From this theological perspective, my goal is to articulate and defend a limited but legitimate use for the neoclassical model and economic models more broadly as a feature of economic science. So the paper proceeds in the following way. First, I talk about defining and identifying exactly what it is we're talking about with the neoclassical model. Second, I talk a little bit about the utility or the usefulness or the fruitfulness of these models. Third, we move on to some salient Christian challenges to homo economicus and particularly those, uh, some of which we've already heard from Stephen during his paper from neo-Calvinist uh, scholars and thinkers. And fourth, before a brief conclusion, I'll talk a little bit about the neo-Calvinist tradition and the morality of models. So first, defining the neoclassical model. The origins of homo economicus remain rather murky. As Werner Plumpe puts it, the biography of the homo economicus has not yet been written. Some have focused on the term itself, tracing it to the Italian political economist Vilfredo Pareto and Maffeo Pantaleoni, 
1906 and 1889, in particular, the dates that are often pointed to. Others point to John Stuart Mill, who in 1844 stated, political economy presupposes an arbitrary definition of man as a being who invariably does that by which he may obtain the greatest amount of necessaries, conveniences, and luxuries with the smallest quantity of labor and physical self-denial which, with which they can be obtained in the existing state of knowledge. That's Mill. If we consider the idea of the human person as primarily an economic agent rather than focusing on the terminology, Latin or, or otherwise, the idea of economic man has been traced back further to Smith and his predecessors in the history of political economy. In any case, the idea of economic man or homo economicus is established sufficiently by Marshall's time that he would use the idea as a point of departure for his own work. This is Marshall, quote, attempts have indeed been made to construct an abstract science with regard to the actions of an economic man who is under no ethical influences and who pursues pecuniary gain warily and energetically, but mechanically and selfishly. But they have not been successful nor even thoroughly carried out, Marshall writes. That's in his preface to the first edition. A generation later, Frank Knight would defend at least some version of the idea as foundational for economics. Quote, the economic man, the familiar subject of theoretical discussion, has been much mistreated by both friends and foes. But such a conception, explicit or implicit, underlies all economic speculation. Knight continues to identify the economic man as, quote, the individual who obeys economic laws, which is merely to say that he obeys some laws of conduct, it being the task of the science to find out what the laws are. He is the rational man, the man who knows what he wants and orders his conduct intelligently with a view to getting it. Now, the question naturally arises here concerning what it might mean for someone to obey laws, economic or otherwise, in a positive rather than a normative sense. It might be better to speak of laws descriptively as consistent patterns of activity rather than as something to be obeyed, which is more likely in line with how Knight understands economic laws to be generated and their authority or lack thereof. A recent paper by Mario Rizzo on the conditions for making sense of economic rationality at a conceptual level grapples with precisely this ambiguity. Axioms such as completeness and transivity, he writes, quote, began to be called norms. Nevertheless, they are norms only in the sense that if you want model behavior in terms of utility function or as rational in the sense constructed, then the axioms must be followed. Thus, he continues, norms in this technical sense are not necessarily prescriptive. Now, Rizzo's intriguing paper continues this line of critique and applies it particularly to the technical and theoretical foundations of behavioral economics. For the moment, however, I think it's simply worth noting that criticisms and limitations of utility maximizing agency or homo economicus, economic man and the like arise from within economics and not simply from without. We're going to focus a lot more on the external critiques in a minute. Another salient engagement with homo economic, economicus arises in McCloskey's memorable characterization of Max U and what is termed P-only economics, focusing on profane as opposed to sacred S or other O variables. The P variables, the profane variables, are beloved of economics, writes McCloskey. The O are beloved of sociology and the S variables are beloved of theology. But we need usually to keep all three in mind or else we're going to get into scientific trouble. For example, if we insist that well-being is all there is, that humans are just pots for pleasure dumping, that any economic analysis by definition must be the exercise and maximizing utility that Samuelson ta taught so well, then we forget the influence of a mother's love for her child beyond price or a businessman's commitment to a faithful identity as a good person beyond profit. The point here is not that Max U, homo economicus, or profane prudence-specific analysis is always and everywhere incorrect. It's simply that such analysis is only part of the whole picture. It captures an aspect of the truth. Thus concludes McCloskey, quote, 
The abstraction of maximizing utility in atomistic competition has great merits. I would be the first to say and have said at great length. But of course, if your model assumes at the outset that people are merely non-language using and acultural pleasure pots, then you're not going to find much room for cooperation, trust, language, S, and O. Now, with all this background in mind, then, we might say there's an identifiable, although contested and contestable, understanding of mainstream neoclassical economics that uses a model of economic man in an attempt to discover and articulate economic laws or norms that have explanatory and potentially predictive power for some identifiable dimension of human behavior. That's a mouthful. The usefulness, usefulness and merits of such an approach is the topic to which we now turn. So, the utility of models. If something like homo economicus is foundational for modern economics, then its usefulness ought to, in some sense, be self-evident, in the sense that whatever good use modern economics as a discipline is responsible for can, in some significant part, be accrued to the conception of economic man which underlies it. Now, whether or not economics has actually contributed positively to the world is contested. And it's, of course, necessary to admit that economics has been put to bad use, whether through overt malfeasance or inadvertent error. The question as to whether economics as such has been a net benefit for humanity will have to be, at least for our context here today, approached through the lens in, of the use and abuse of homo economicus itself as representative of economic models more generally. Now, as we'll see in the next section, a great deal of criticism of homo, homo economicus comes from what we might call a realist perspective. The claim here is that real flesh and blood people are not utility maximizers, whatever that might mean. As McCloskey puts it, the non-economists see the world as O and S, other and sacred largely. The economists want the world to be profane only. The world, McCloskey says, isn't buying. But of course, part of what makes a model useful at all in the first place is that it's an abstraction and a simplification. The question is whether it is necessarily an oversimplification such that it becomes not simply an abstract re representation but a reductive caricature. Now, the perdurance of homo economicus as an analytical tool is in the first place some evidence of its usefulness and fruitfulness. Modern sciences generally have little tolerance for explanatory devices that don't carry water. The progress of positivistic scientific enterprise itself has little, if any, sentimentality about such matters. If a model must flatten reality in some sense to make itself usable, the recognition of the limitations of any such model is therefore critical. This is, in fact, much of what self, the self-criticism arising from economists about the economic endeavor has amounted to from the beginning of the modern period. Frank Knight, for example, discusses the temporal and epistemic limitations of economic science and articulates what amounts to a kind of hypothetical regarding the salience of economic man. This is Knight. For the time being, in, in uh, emphasis, an individual acts, more or less, as if his conduct were directed to the realization of some end more or less ascertainable, but at best provisional and vague. In light of this kind of epistemic humility, Knight argues that, quote, the definition of economics must, therefore, be revised to state that it treats of conduct insofar as conduct is amenable to scientific treatment, insofar as it is controlled by definable conditions and can be reduced to law. But this, measured by the standard of natural science, is not very far. This is perhaps not the most ringing endorsement of the utility of economic science. Indeed, it's a remarkably chastened statement especially when compared to some of the claims about the ability of economics to speak to every square inch of human life that we will look at in a moment. A key phrase from Knight's chase into defense of economic science is that hypothetical as if. Indeed, this kind of perspective could be seen as a predecessor to Milton Friedman's more famous as if articulation of positive economic methodology. This is Friedman. A meaningful scientific hypothesis or theory typically asserts that certain forces are and other forces are not important in understanding a particular class of phenomena. It's frequently convenient to present such a hypothesis by stating that the phenomena it is desired to predict behave in the world of observation as if they occurred in a hypothetical and highly simplified world containing only the forces that the hypothesis asserts to be important. <clears throat> 
Now, Friedman's point here is essentially that the simplicity and predictive utility of a model or set of assumptions are the determinative factors for its scientific value, not primarily whether that model or set of assumptions is a more or less accurate representation of the real world. So this is an instrumental understanding of the use of models. In their significant exploration of the significance of the neoclassical model in our contemporary world, John Lunn and Robin Clay pick up on precisely this line of defense for the ongoing usefulness of something like Homo economicus. Lunn and Clay define the neoclassical model of economic science as follows, quote, the study of how individuals seeking to maximize their welfare make choices about consumption and production when faced with scarcity of resources, money, and time. They helpfully elaborate on some of the basic assumptions of this model. Economists employ an assumption about human behavior that non-economists often find controversial. People are assumed to make choices rationally that are in their own self-interest. Both consumers and producers are said to be rational in that they strive to achieve their goals by considering the costs and benefits of alternative approaches to those goals. This is not to deny that on occasion producers and consumers will do something on mere whim. They do especially when the consequences of a choice are insignificant relative to the costs and time and other factors of deliberating about the matter in detail. However, neoclassical economists emphasize broad patterns in consumer behavior which do reflect consideration the actors give to changing marginal costs, benefits, and alternatives. Furthermore, Lund and Clay continue, though not every single person in each instance behaves rationally, economists rely on the expectation that a sufficient number of actors do explicitly or implicitly calculate their interests in this manner. So in some sense then, the self-awareness of the economic actors is immaterial to this kind of analysis. It doesn't matter if one recognizes oneself to be rationally calculating self-interest. It only matters if the action an economic actor takes is consistent with acting as if someone is acting out of rational self-interest. Lund and Clay conclude their lucid and brief praise of the neoclassical model with two further caveats. Anticipating some criticisms, they raise the question, does the neoclassical model completely describe human behavior and motivation? Obviously not. But there are two points to keep in mind. First, economic theory does not try to explain or predict the behavior of every specific individual. Instead, the theories are intended to explain and predict the net result of the actions of many people. Second, most neoclassical, most neoclassical economists do not try to apply economic theory to all aspects of human existence. One of the founders of the neoclassical approach said, quote, political economy or economics is a study of mankind in the ordinary business of life. Now, this founder of the neoclassical approach is, of course, Alfred Marshall. And this articulation of the neoclassical model and its assumptions can be understood as a kind of chastened or, I would argue, properly delineated understanding of economic science. Such a perspective of economics as a social science, as distinct from the social science, is in contrast with another trend in economics in the 20th century, the view of economics as the imperial science. This is in different ways an approach commonly associated with George Stigler and Gary Becker, among others. On this view, homo economicus is not simply a figure you find in the boardroom, but also in the bedroom and everywhere in between. It's perhaps this imperialistic turn in economics as much as anything else that has raised the ire of theologians and ethicists most recently. It claims to be able to explain not simply some dimensions of human existence or most kinds of decisions people make in mundane circumstances, but to be able to explain all of human activity in economic terms is an overtly imperialistic claim that other disciplines – whether sociology, political science, the humanities, natural sciences, or theology, feel compelled to challenge. It's a subset of such challenges of economics, whether understood as an imperial or merely a social science, that we now turn. So Christian challenges to homo economicus. Now before moving on to articulate a particularly neo-Calvinistic challenge to neoclassical economics, I think it's worthwhile to briefly survey a number of other criticisms leveled at homo economicus from a variety of Christian perspectives. In a somewhat recent article in the journal Markets and Morality, Brian Fickert and Michael Rhodes contrast homo economicus with an understanding of the human person created in the image of God, homo imago dei. 
As Fickert and Rhodes write, quote, the narratives, institutions, policies, and practices of mainstream economics that are at the heart of globalization tend to transform homo imago dei into homo economicus, an autonomous, individualistic, purely self-interested, materialistic creature. Fickert and Rhodes are not criticizing free market economies as such. Rather, their concern is squarely with the neoclassical model that we've been investigating thus far, at least as they understand it. As they put it, their concern is with, quote, the current form of mainstream Western economics that's being exported to the world. They describe homo economicus as a representation, therefore, of mainstream economic orthodoxy. After taking issue with the positive normative, normative distinction as it's typically employed in mainstream economics, and here actually Fickert and Rhodes employ Kautzward and some of the neoclassical or neo-Calvinist economists that Stephen was mentioning earlier, Fickert and Rhodes turn particular attention to the neoclassical model. In their presentation, quote, the autonomous individual, homo economicus, an individualistic, purely self-interested, materialistic creature who rationally allocates its income in order to maximize its happiness by increasing its consumption while doing as little work as possible. That's their definition of homo economicus. Now, homo imago dei is not the only challenger to the dominance of homo economicus, however. Other scholars have proposed different models that might either replace or complement the mainstream neoclassical model. Edward O'Boyle has surveyed the history of homo economicus, cataloged a multitude of alternatives, and proposed his own, homo socioeconomicus. So you have not a purely individualistic but an other related, personal, as opposed to a model. Another approach taken by the economist Robert C. Tatum is to theologically contextualize homo economicus as representative of fallen humanity. As Tatum puts it, homo economicus is an appropriate persona of fallen man. We draw on our earthly wisdom to make choices in a world of scarcity. The opportunity for theology in this context is to provide a complementary and more comprehensive framework for understanding the task of secular mainstream fallen economics. Now, these three engagements with homo economicus from a variety of Christian perspectives can be seen as representative of three basic approaches, radical rejection, uh, attempt at reformation, or contextualization framing. The first approach sees the neoclassical model as a false god. Fickert and Rhodes use that language, an idol to be cast down and broken. The second sees the model as inherently flawed or limited and in need of substantial revision or expansion or correction. And the third sees homo economicus as a useful and understandable, albeit sharply limited, tool in need of proper contextualization. Now, neo-Calvinism as a distinct tradition has its own history within the development of modern economics, some of which has been covered by Yels Tankstmengel uh, as well as Stephen McMullen in an earlier session today. Um, Stephen talked about Paul Oslington's article. He's identified this kind of neo-Calvinistic school of thought that radically challenges this neoclassical approach. Gautzward is a founding figure of this movement falling broadly in the tradition of Kuiper and Herman Doiweird. A group of scholars at Calvin College, notably including John Teamster, Stephen Monsma, and Alan Storkey, also issued a challenge to mainstream economics. As Oslington characterizes it, a resulting text that these scholars produced, quote, began with methodological and ethical criticism of the neoclassical method, then set out their own Christian alternative based on a set of biblical norms for economic life. Now, a discussion of Ossington's evaluation of this enterprise is beyond the scope of this paper. Um, maybe, Stephen, I can talk about it later. I don't know if anybody else has read it, but you should. It's in Faith and Economics last year. But a key dimension of this dispute is over the legitimacy of mainstream economics, including the neoclassical model. These Calvinist economists reject the model and propose a distinctively Christian and even reformed foundation for an alternative economics. As Teamster puts it, and this is in uh, the – the lecture he gave that Steve, Stephen referred to as a victory lap. Recent developments, particularly in behavioral and game theory, have led to, quote, the gradual discrediting of the neoclassical can canonical model and its abandonment for research purposes. The result is a need for a new economics, a Christian economics grounded on reliable and true foundations. Other notable neo-Calvinist figures in the 20th century, however, who depart in one way or another from these previously mentioned writers include Rimmer de Vries, who had a doctoral dissertation in economics in 1955 from Ohio State, Hendrik van Riesen, a philosopher in 1957, and Abraham Zegers in 1958 with a, a text um, 
polemically arguing about the development of anti-revolutionary political economy from Kuiper to Keynes. These figures can be understood as broadly representing, I think, a kind of Dutch reformed analog to the German ordo liberal tradition. Now, we've seen one version of a neo-Calvinist challenge to the neoclassical model in Teamstra et al. And Steve did a really good job introducing that. They strongly reject the conception of economic man and argue for a radical reformation of economics. Is there a basis, however, for a different kind of neo-Calvinist challenge to the neoclassical model? Following Oslington, I want to briefly outline just such a challenge, one which affirms a real but limited space for economic science to pursue its own ends according to its own methods, thereby recognizing and protecting its integrity. As we've seen, one version of a Kuyperian or neo-Calvinist approach to mainstream science, whether economic, political, or natural, radically distinguishes between two types of science, that which is pursued by Christians and that which is pursued by non-Christians. This perspective, as Oslington notes, has a particularly strong notion of sphere sovereignty defined according to various worldviews. It also emphasizes the neo-Calvinist theme of the antithesis and, at least on Oslington's evaluation, downplays common grace. There is, I think, another authentically Kuyperian or neo-Calvinist possibility, however, one that builds on common grace and a more restrained notion of sphere sovereignty. On this view, different disciplines, areas of life, and ways of living all have their own integrity that ought to be respected. But it balances respect for these pluriform expressions of human life with a broader architectonic understanding of divine order. But against monistic expressions of Christian faith, which seek an external integralization of all of life, this kind of Kuyperian or neo-Calvinist perspective emphasizes the importance of internal integralization, the coherence and confluence of the deepest convictions of a person's identity and community and that the external expression of that and manifestation of it in the world. On this view, there are not simply hermetically sealed spheres defined by confessional, ethnic, or economic identity. There is, in fact, a diverse array of areas which are common ground for all kinds of people. The scientific realm, the arena of academic scholarship, is one such realm, which takes expression in a variety of institutional forms. It's from this kind of neo-Calvinist perspective that a challenge can be brought to economics that does not destroy and replace it with entirely new creation de novo, but rather one which models itself on the broader Kuyperian and reformed perspective of grace transforming, renewing, and restoring nature. A neo-Calvinist challenge to economics is for economics to be true to its true self, sovereign and secure in its own sphere, appropriately limited and defined by other spheres, and thereby free to flourish and be fruitful, and to contribute to the broader development of all of human society and indeed of creation itself. The final subsection here before a brief um, conclusion I have called the morality of models. Now, it's in that spirit that I want to conclude with some observations about the nature of models and particularly some observations about what we might call the morality of models. We've already noted that for a model to be useful, it has to be reductive in some sense. It has to simplify reality. In that way, models are inherently limited. They inevitably distort reality. The key question is whether a particular model distorts in a way that leaves what it is intended to represent as unrecognizable. Does the inevitable distortion that models create deceive or mislead in some fundamental way? I want to unpack the significance of this question in two ways, both of which are inspired by a Kuyperian way of thinking. I wouldn't say Kuyper would agree with me, but they're inspired by Kuyper, at least according to me. <laughs> the first has to do with what we might call the metaphysical significance of models. And the second has to do with the social significance of models. So every model takes some aspect or aspects of reality and enlarges them while reducing or eliminating others. For social sciences, these models often have to do with the individual human person, although they don't have to. They can be broader social models. The formation of useful social scientific models is no easy task. This is in part explains the continuing utilization of homo economicus despite the many slings and arrows to which it's been subject. Economic man, thus understood, may be flawed, but it's not easy to formulate an alternative that's tractable in a meaningful way. Social scientific models like Homo economicus give us up a picture of the human person. In this way, I argue, they presuppose and represent an anthropology, 
an understanding of the human person, a more a broader understanding of the human person. And anthropology is thus, I would say, a predicate of a social scientific model. But I think we can take this one step further. From a Christian perspective, the human person is created in the image of God, objectively speaking. The anthrop this anthropological view therefore presupposes a theology. Whether we recognize it or not, whether it's implicit or implicit, anthropological and theological assumptions are in this way, I think, embedded in social scientific models. This is my metaphysical point, which should, I think, at the very least give us pause as we work on constructing or deconstructing models. The social dimension of this has to do with the function of models, not only in terms of the scientific discipline but um, what we might say more broadly in terms of socialization. Critics of the neoclassical models such as Fickert and Rhodes point to a pedagogical dimension that scientific models have. And I think this is at least intuitively true. If models implicitly have a broader anthropology and theology behind them, then they're also teaching us something about our identity, our place in the world, and our relationship or lack thereof, depending on the model, to transcendent reality. In this way, there's a sense in which models are not only descriptive. They are also prescriptive, even if only implicitly. Models can become self-fulfilling. It thus makes a difference whether homo economicus is an abstraction and is carefully used as such, or whether it's a caricature, a funhouse mirror that transforms our own self-understanding. In this sense, what we teach and learn as models, even if only as analytical tools, are more than simply descriptive devices. They're means of teaching us about ourselves and can become literal models for us to emulate. This, I think, is behind much of the philosophical and economic concern about the phenomenon of, for example, mass man that animates the thinking of writers like Wilhelm Rupke. They understood that our theories about humanity, including how these theories become embedded in social sciences and their analytical tools, can both describe reality as well as form it. The 19th century Russian novelist Ivan Turgenev captured the two visions of humanity offered by totalitarian collectivism and atomistic individualism remarkably well. In the mouth of Bazarov in Fathers and Children, Turgenev captures the social scientific mindset which reduces human beings to mere models. Quote, Studying separate individuals is not worth the trouble. All people resemble each other. Each of us has a brain, spleen, and lungs made alike, and the moral qualities are the same in all. The slight variations are of no importance. A single human specimen is sufficient to judge all the rest. No botanist would think of studying each individual birch tree. In conclusion, the challenge from neo-Calvinism for neoclassical economics that I've tried to put forth here is the challenge to retain, retain the legitimacy of the social scientific enterprise in economics without somehow reducing the significance and dignity of the individual human person created in the image and likeness of God. The challenge is to rightly use and not to abuse analytical tools, mathematics, and models like homo economicus and to make sure that we keep them within their proper limits. There's a classical and ancient Latin phrase, sutor ne ultra crepidam. It means shoemaker, not beyond the shoe. It's a warning to each of us to rightly exercise sovereignty and responsibility within our own spheres, but not to dominate or try to dominate or tyrannize others. It's in that spirit that I offer these reflections as a theologian uh, and a challenge from neo-Calvinism, from neoclassical economics. Um, it's time, I think, for questions, and you can free to feel to tell me, theologian, not beyond theology. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Jordan. Good job. Thanks, Cooper. <laughs> um, so does adopting the view of man as homo imago dei uh, imply a sort of duty to satisfy religious needs and or governmental limitation on uh, the kind of the economic aspect of man? Um, I would say definitely yes to the first. If you're talking about Ficker and Rhodes' uh, articulation, I recommend that article. It's in the Journal Markets Rally from 2017. It's called uh, – Homo imago dei versus homo economicus or vice versa. Um, I don't know – I don't think they go into requirements for what government is supposed to do then in terms of making the religious aspect of it um, 
open or keeping it open. But um, there are at least Fickard is working and inspired in some ways by this kind of neo-Calvinist tradition of economics uh, that we've been talking about a little bit. So um, I would pr presume that there's a kind of a pluralistic view there. Yeah. Great. There we go, Sarah. The other side. Okay, we'll go to the other Sarah afterwards. Sorry, that's, that's fine. <laughs> no worries. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, so many questions and thoughts. I'm, I'm really excited to hear more about how you put these things together. It's really good. Um, I am going to pick one. And uh, this idea that models distort reality, it just, the word distort had not occurred to me before. So I'm thinking out loud a little bit here. And yeah. I'm thinking as an economist, I'm thinking about trade offs, right? The, can we make much of reality without simplifying, right? So what's, what's a neo-Calvinist view on our ability? Our eyes distort reality, right? Uh, distractions distort reality. The complexity of the world is distorted in our own eyes. So I think of models as allowing us to necessarily simplify so that we can make something out of a complex reality. Again, thinking out loud, but the question is, what do you think? What does yeah. neo-Calvinism have to say about that? Um, I think... I think that's true. It's unavoidably true. Um, and I, I did use the word distort, which obviously has some kind of a – usually a negative connotation in a kind of a challenging way because I um, – but I, I think it's an unavoidable aspect of our uh, embodied existence as you pointed to. Um, and we should grapple with that uh, in understanding what we're doing when we're working with models. I just think we need to keep that in mind, um, that there is an – not just an abstraction, but something of a distortion, that, or at least something that can lead to negative consequences if we don't keep that those inherent limitations in mind. Dylan will like this. Actually, I was trying to think of a way to articulate this, the necessity of this, and it, it was Star Trek came up. Um, you know, so they're on the bridge, and there's like a screen, right? And um, you see things on the screen. Well, the screen is like two dimensional. It's a distortion of what's actually out there some four-dimensional thing that's existing in time and space and all that sort of thing. But you need it, or at least we want it as television viewers so that we can have a, something to see and what's going on. Um, and you can get into the physics of how a Cleon cruiser can disappear from a screen that you're looking at and the models that go into it. So there's a physical element to it too. But I do think, yeah, to get back to to circle back around in a long way to your question or your point, I totally agree. There's a distortionary effect that any of these kinds of models and even kind of our physical limitations um, impose on us and it's good to recognize them and limit them where we recognize that the distortion is actually destructive or I don't know exactly where the line is between, you know, a, a faithful abstraction or a, an abstraction that distorts not too much but one that turns it into a caricature, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> okay, and then. Sarah Negri. Thanks, Jordan. My question is also on your comments on models. Um, I've worked somewhat with mathematical models in the past, and one f uh, factor about them is that they they need verification. You need the empirical results to really show, like, is this effective? And the proof of a good model is in the results. If it, if it works, then it modeled what it's trying to model effectively. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you know of anybody who is using mathematical models with a more holistic picture of the human person, if anybody is trying to mathematize, mathematize um, these S and O elements of the human person? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and, and yeah, I think you're right. That's exactly what Friedman's trying to articulate with respect to whether a model is useful or not. Um, if it, if it produces a result that can be measured and it agrees with experiment, to, to use uh, Richard Feynman's kind of language about the scientific method, then it's, then it's useful. Um, I don't personally – I was told there would be no math. I think I made that joke earlier. I'm sorry. Um, but maybe some of the economists in the room actually do know some of these things that are going on um, to try to um, make um, – sacred and other values tractable in some science, social scientific way. I assume it's going on in sociology. Maybe part of what's going on – well, I'm not going to say that. Okay. I thought of uh, else has an answer to that. Ed O'Boyle, uh, his work a little mm -hmm. bit deals with that. Yeah, right. So, I mean, part of what he's trying to do with homo socioeconomicus is actually give us a model that's useful. 
part of what happens when theologians are like promote, pr I'm not saying Fickert and Rhodes do this, part of what happens when theologians critique homo economicus, it's like, well, that's not an accurate view of the human person. It's like much more holistic, right? We're real flesh and blood people who have dignity. And it's like, okay, but how do we measure that, you know, in terms of what we're talking about? Like, it's not necessary that somebody who's using a model disputes that. So some of those critiques, I think, miss the point, to be honest. Uh, that was really good. I'm going to have to read it more carefully. <laughs> You're a very bright man. Um, I have a question for you about. I'm I'm sort of new to the the this whole conversation, and with the idea of these different spheres in life that have uh, different patterns and and norms that they're supposed to fulfill. When and we live in these different spheres, mm -hmm. and we we cross into them. Are we constantly going through this kind of code switching exercise of language change? And with that, how do we, how do we feel as though life has this, this uh, holistic feeling mm -hmm. as we enter in all these different spheres? I mean, I, I sort of had this idea that you're the same person, you should be the same person in every sphere, but I'm sort of having that uh, question as I get yeah. into this whole thing. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's unavoidable. We do code switch across different contexts. Um, but I, I take the deeper question there and the more, the more significant existential kind of point to be how do we understand ourselves um, as having a kind of a unity of identity across all of these different experiences and institutions and spheres. And I actually think um, the kind of traditional Protestant way of talking about vocation, for example, exacerbates rather than ameliorates this this problem right so typically we talk about vocation as like some aspect of what you do in terms of your human activity often your your paid job or some primary identity you have in terms of serving others it could be a parent or whatever right we, that's our vocation and then we have this language of avocation or something like this um, I advocate um, thinking of, from a Christian perspective, your vocation in a, in a broader sense as following Christ, which takes on all kinds of different dimensions and aspects depending on your personal, historical, genealogical, geographical circumstances. Um, so what it means to follow Christ in a particular person's life is going to look radically different from another's. But that's at least my attempt to articulate something that gets at what you're, I think, accurately pointing to, which is that we need to retain some kind of unity of identity across all these different dimensions. So at least in my own thinking, I've found that to be helpful. And I would argue um, when we talk about vocation from a Christian perspective that we should talk about vocation in this primary sense, and maybe it's too abstract, um, but I do think it helpfully actually captures some of this dynamic that you're pointing to, because it is a real problem to think about, well, if my vocation is just one, this one piece of what I'm doing, but in our increasingly complicated lives, um, I do a lot of other things too. So is that part of my vocation? I mean, there's a way in which that understanding can actually reinforce a sacred secular kind of dichotomy, which I think is unhealthy. So my inspiration for that kind of formulation is Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right? He talks about in discipleship, that's the primary identity. And he, in his own way, he's trying to reformulate a Lutheran understanding of vocation in this more comprehensive sense, which he would argue, and I would argue, is actually more faithful to Luther than the kind of that other version of vocation that we've talked about. Not that I think that Protestant, you know, um, doctrine of vocation is wrong or anything like that, but I think some of the language we've used is is not as helpful as it could otherwise be. Still some time, Dan. So, <clears throat> what, one of the interesting things when you're talking about the neoclassical tradition and sort of the use of models is that the physical sciences use these sorts of models as well. Um, the periodic table is a sort of model. Um, it's distortionary, though, right? It I mean, is. Well, this is the thing: is, is, the, is, is yeah. Christians Christians don't seem to go at geologists 
and say, you're being reductive with your models. We know the creation is more than this. We know God breathed it into the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Why do you think economics in particular gets, gets this sort of treatment from the theologians in a way that, let's say, the physical sciences or even social sciences that have considerably less consensus than economics. You don't have theologians going hard after sociology or hard after psychology to the same extent that you seem to get with economics. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some truth to the phenomenon you're describing. And part of the answer, you know, a flippant answer would be that's where the money is. (laughs) Um, This is actually a question that I have for the economists, not that they have to, the ones in the room have to answer it, but I, I actually do have for economics as a science, um, which I take at least uh, when comparing it, say, to natural sciences, and I think of like theoretical physics, for example, it's not just one model that they have, right? You have a bunch of different people, like there's not consensus in many ways, so there's more diversity of methodological approaches that are, yeah, you have nasty fights between different methodologies and schools of, of, in different sci- – within economics too. Um, but yeah, even, even for kind of a, a theoretical physicist, they have to have – and again, I'm, I'm taking Richard Feynman at his word – a bunch of different – discrete systems that they can bring to apply to come up with a, um, a hypothesis that can be tested. And it's not a matter of just one little thing changing is the way he puts it. You have to have completely discrete models of how all this stuff could work and be coherent. Um, and you know, he, at one point he talks about having – like any half good, half decent theoretical physicist has to have half a dozen of these at hand in their mind, holding them in their mind. They're totally different worldviews. They're totally different ways of thinking about physics. I don't – do economists do that? I don't know. That's like my question. Like, is this? I mean, from Stephen's talk, it seems uh, maybe there is some truth to the fact that this classical model, neoclassical model, is on the wane. Although it's still what gets taught um, in many cases, at least in, in terms of introductory uh, economics. But are there really robust alternative full models that are out there? Um, so that doesn't answer the question about why theologians, you know, have so much. Uh, fire and brimstone to hurl upon economists, but it does ra- it does get to a kind of a question that I have in terms of comparing these disciplines, um, especially when you're getting to things like mathematization of something and, and this um, math envy or something that you know e- economics wants to be physics or something like that. At least in terms of how definite it can be um, for physicists, physicists, they've got a bunch of different models and it's not that economics doesn't depending on the, you know, macro versus micro and things like that. But at least I'm just curious if, is there that institutional or, um, diversity of models across the discipline in a way that's analogous to what I'm talking about for physics. But, um, I also think that economics in many ways touches our lives in a much more upfront existential fashion. Um, I thought Sarah might ask about the imperial turn in science or economics or something like that. But I mean there's a way in which the natural scientists and economists have been vying for supremacy in terms of their social power over the last century and a half. And so economics, you know, people like Bob Nelson and others have written about economics as a kind of a religion and there's a, a clerical class and there's a status to the being a prophet or the economist is a preacher and things like that. They have this kind of – authority, uh, a priesthood even, that uh, had been reserved for religious clergy previously. Um, So when you're displaced in terms of your influence and so on, sometimes you, you know, pay some attention to the thing that displaced you and you're not always happy about it and maybe rightly so in some cases, right? So I don't mean to say that like all complaints that theologians have about economics are driven by self-interest or something like that. That would be to apply homo economicus to (laughs) theologians. Still time for questions. Oh, good. Dr. McMullen. Um, lots of thoughts. It's it really, really, uh, really enjoyable, though. I, um, let me ask about this. So something I don't understand about sphere sovereignty, that maybe you will, is I don't understand if we're going to think about spheres being sovereign, and you're kind of using this as an analogy to think about some limits about where we apply economics. 
Um, my question about sphere sovereignty is how do you define the edges? Because sovereignty is, is always kind of a, you know, you stay on your side of the line, I'll stay on my side of the line. But of course, drawing the lines is the whole question. Yeah. And so, you know, by analogy, it, it, your suggestion is that economics needs to maybe be more limited. How do we know what the limits are? Some people would say Gary Becker crossed the line when he modeled family behavior. I think most of what Gary Becker did was really neat. <laughs> but I also agree he might have crossed the line. I like and even in my, mind, my own mind. I don't, I'm not entirely sure, like, yeah. I'd, I'd say economists shouldn't do that. So how do you, how do you draw the line such that economics could be more chastened, maybe, and not overstep its bounds um, in a way that would be theologically principled. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad you added that caveat that it's got to be theologically principled, because I was just going to say, well, just listen to me, and I'll tell you what everybody should do. <laughs> From Kuiper's perspective, I think one way of thinking about sphere sovereignty is that n new spheres, in terms of the discovery of new spheres, arises organically, and there's a kind of a... I don't know if competition is the right word, but there's a period of like um, maturation and uh, like creating elbow room for your for yourself if you're a sphere that's coming into being or being recognized. And so there is, in this sense, a constant kind of I don't know if friction is the right word, but there's a constant kind of um, struggle between the spheres. So I'm, I'm, gonna not, I'm not here to support class struggle, but I'm here to defend sphere struggle. Um, that in some sense can be healthy because you're constantly um, in a Madisonian sense or something like that, tr needing to keep each other, e each of these spheres, um, given our fallen human nature, is, is going to seek to enlarge itself at the expense of other spheres improperly. And so part of that is just a kind of organic and free, spontaneous play of different types of authority. Um, and some of it arises out of just um, intuitive recognition of the authority. So, you know, Kuiper will talk about things like genius as a, as a, as a manifestation in different spheres, like that it just is na it naturally commands respect, right? Um, and there may be a human tendency to listen to somebody who's a genius in one area in all areas, but if we recognize that you're a genius in this area, then there's a kind of a natural understanding, well, when, when he or she is talking about that thing, we should pay attention, but maybe when they have opinions about other stuff, it does, it's not as relevant. Um, and part of it also, I think, does have to do with a kind of in a inherent ambiguity about sphere sovereignty in Kuiper's own thought. There's debates about how important it was, how significant it was, certainly how systematized his thinking was. My own take on that is Kuiper was intentionally ambiguous in some ways because he wanted to make sure that he left open conceptual space for new spheres that he would have never thought of to be arise because he saw that in his own reading of history happen providentially that – you know, I'll talk about art this way, that art, you know, for a while was within the sphere of the church and then it had to, like, exercise its own sovereignty or autonomy and struggle free, uh, like a bud breaking forth or something like that. And who knows what other spheres that are out there um, that there might yet be to discover. So in that sense, um, in the intervening 120 plus years since Kuiper was talking about that, there have been new spheres we could say that have developed that we didn't even know existed. So that's not a direct answer to the question about how we determine the lines. Um, there is definitely a, a, a role for some ordering authority, the state, to intervene, though, for Kuiper. This is what Jim was talking about, too, right? So when there is conflict and the elbows become elbow drops or you start pulling guns to, like, tyrannize the other sphere, then you do have a role for some uh, supervening authority to come in and, and disarm the threat, so to speak. Okay, we have time for one more question. Jim, do you have yeah. time for a question but no answer? <laughs> <laughs> one question and one answer. Um, you have to remember, at least at the start, the way Kuiper conceptualized these spheres is that they were uh, more of a trajectory. There's a built-in dynamic for this kind of activity in creation, and human beings are discovering and amplifying and using those more and more. But this trajectory is teleological. It has its built-in principle and arising out of it will be an appropriate language. Um, so when you're using the language of the economy to talk about family life, that's a real violation. When you're trying to run your church like a business, 
that's a real that's going to and it does cause real problems when you try to <laughs> get close to us now when you try to run uh, the academy as a business it's going to go really badly so are you using the authentic language of your sphere are you using the language authentic to your sphere and when uh, you're imp exporting that to another sphere you've gone too far that, that, I think that would be Kuiper's answer yeah just to that uh, made me think of one other thing is I do think that for Kuiper too um, there's a kind of a natural law and flourishing salience that you can have there are litmus tests, right? Like, so when, when people are suffering and there's manifest injustice, then something has gone wrong and some sphere isn't operating correctly. You got to identify the sphere and exactly what's gone wrong. But, um, it's easier to identify the defects than it is to positively state the boundaries in that sense. All right. Thank you so much, Jordan. And thank you all for coming. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of. If you're familiar with our past content or have attended an Acton event and would like to see it in a future episode, you can email us at producer at Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Gabriel Zsa. Zsa.